right, good welcome everybody. I make that 11.30, so let's get started. Uh, welcome, great to see so many of you here uh, for this session about testing Spring Boot applications. My name's Andy Wilkinson, uh, I work for Pivotal, where I spend most of my time working on Spring Boot. Uh, I'm also the lead of uh, Spring Restox. So, before we kind of get into some of the lower level technical details of testing Spring Boot applications, I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about why, why do we bother testing at all? It's perhaps not the most glamorous part of our jobs, but I think it is one of the most important. So a show of hands, how many of you here have tests that are automated and run without you having to do anything? Pretty much all of you, that's, that's good to see. And how many of you have a situation where you can commit a change, some tests run, and then something pops out into a production environment at the other end of some sort of deployment pipeline? No, yeah, it's still pretty good. Okay, great. So why do we bother testing at all? Well, I think primarily we test to reduce risk. Um, that's what you should be looking to do when you're writing tests. You're trying to allow the code that you've written to make its way successfully from your machine into a production environment. Um, so as lots of you appear to agree with, having those tests be automated and run every time you make a change has big benefits because you know you get some degree of assurance that when you've made a change, if it's passed those tests, that it's not gonna go horribly wrong when it pops out the other end. So I think though, it's important to think about things when you're adding tests, why you're adding them, and what that can do um, in terms of reducing risk. If you have no tests at all, your risk is basically as high as it can be. And I think the, the most important thing you can do is add the first test. So in a Spring Boot application, um, if you were only going to have one test, a test that refreshes the application context already gets rid of quite a lot of risk. If you have one test that refreshes the context, then you know, hopefully, that all of your beans are available, all of your dependency injection will work, your, you know, the web server will start, et cetera, et cetera. But as you add more tests, the benefit that you get from adding those tests and the reduction in risk actually decreases. And it can be get into cases where if you're blindly adding tests to your application, you're not really reducing the risk very much at all. And this is one area where I think that code coverage can actually do more harm than good. How many of you pay attention to code coverage numbers for your tests? If you take one thing away from this talk, I'd like you to start ignoring your code coverage numbers or not treating them as gospel. I've worked in teams before where you weren't allowed, a code wasn't allowed to kind of move on to the next stage until it was 80% code coverage, you know, 80% branch coverage or 80% line coverage, whatever metric it was that they decided to focus on. And you got into this ridiculous situation where someone was at 79% code coverage and they just wanted their change to make it into production or to the next stage. So they'd add a test for a getter method just to cover one more line of code. And actually, what, are, what is the chance of you having made a mistake in a getter method? It's probably zero or near to zero. So you've added that one more test and you think, oh, Co-coverage coverage has gone up, risk has gone down, it can move to the next stage. Meanwhile, you could have a 50-line method that's full of horrible complex logic that no one really knows how to test or has bothered testing, and that's just sitting there untested. You may have changed that 50-line method with all sorts of branches in it and not bothered testing it, but because you added a test for a getter, your untested code was allowed to kind of move along to the next stage of the pipeline. So code coverage can kind of be a guide to tell you, you know, some tests have run and some methods were executed, but I think you need to, you need to look more into detail about what has been covered and not pay too much attention just to the uh, percentages that code coverage provides you. I think the other important thing when you're thinking about your tests is to embrace the fact that realistically you are never going to reduce the risk to zero. It doesn't matter how many tests you write, things are still going to go wrong in a production environment. And so I think there needs to come a point where you ask yourself, 
is it worth adding any more tests? Is it worth writing a complex test that scaffolds a complex environment? And maybe say it's a problem that only happens under very high load or with certain you know, concurrent conditions. You could try and recreate that, for example, in a staging environment and then have some regression test suite that tries to replicate that workload where this thing one time went wrong in production. I think you'll end up spending more time keeping that staging environment vaguely in sync with production than you'll, you'll gain from perhaps avoiding that problem recurring in production. I think you have to accept at some point that things are going to go wrong. And so you should stop investing your time in writing more tests and think about instead investing time in making your production environment more observable. So when things go wrong in production, you get metrics out of it, you get logs out of it, you get whatever you like out of it that lets you quickly pinpoint something's gone wrong, wrong in production and quickly identify what went wrong and then hopefully push a fix or roll back to a previous state. So another thing that you can do, not always appropriate for all sorts of problems, but being able to roll back to a previous known good state can also be beneficial. So if you push something into production and your test didn't catch the problem and all hell breaks loose, you've got two choices. One is you try and fix it, but that can be stressful. If your service isn't available and that's critical for your business, those conditions aren't ideal to be trying to make a change because presumably you made a mistake when you weren't under pressure and now if you are under pressure trying to fix this as quickly as possible, the chances of you making another mistake are quite high. So if you've invested time in being able to roll back, then that might have been a better investment than spending more time writing complex kind of system integration type tests. And I think when you're writing tests, you should also think about the sort of mistakes that you make. And this will vary from team to team. So the people painting the, uh, the school writing on this road, they obviously, they were good with colors. They got all the letters the same color, but not so good with spelling. You'll know in your team the sort of mistakes that you make and in your domain, the sort of things that you often get wrong. And that's where the risk lies. And that's where code coverage can be misleading because not all lines are equal. And if it's a common mistake that you individually make or that you know members of your team makes, then that's a good place for you to focus your attention when you're writing your tests, rather than again, just kind of being concerned with, I need to hit a certain uh, code coverage percentage. All right, so that's hopefully kind of level set things a bit about why we write tests and how I kind of think about the sort of tests that we should be writing and when perhaps we should stop writing tests. And I want to start talking about the actual testing side um, of a Spring Boot application. And I think a good place to start, a place where a lot of people start, is with unit tests. And really, if you're unit testing a Spring Boot application, you're not actually testing a Spring Boot application at all. Your individual units um, should have very little, if anything, to do with Spring or Spring Boot. And this is something, you know, back in whenever it was, 2003 or so, Spring Boot, uh, sorry, Spring Framework got an awful lot of traction because it let you write code as plain old Java objects. It, we moved away from the then Java 2, uh, J2 EE way of doing things where you had to subclass things. So if you'd written an EJB, it was very difficult to test it without kind of all the scaffolding that an EJB container gave you. And Spring let you just write a plain old Java object that you could then test very easily just in a standard unit test without having to worry about having an EJB container or a servlet container or whatever may it be. And that holds true, you know, with like 15, 16 years later. And I think that still holds true now that you can get quite a lot of mileage out of just writing unit tests for your application, testing individual units. Now, some people don't like unit tests and think that you should write more kind of functional tests because they consider the unit tests to be difficult to evolve. You know, if you uh, rewrite a chunk of your application, then you've got all these unit tests that then also need to be rewritten. And I think I have some sympathy for that argument and I'm not really sure that there's anything right or wrong here, um, but it is something to be aware of with the sort of tests that you're writing that if they are reducing risk, presumably you want to keep them. So as you evolve your application, you're going to want to evolve the tests as well. 
Um, so when you're writing tests, you want to be thinking about writing them um, in a way, you know, you want them to be as concise as possible so that hopefully they are uh, not too time consuming uh, for you to evolve as your application evolves. That may mean for you that unit tests are fine. That may mean for you that you have a few unit tests and you focus more on functional tests. It's just something to think about in your team what works best for the sort of application that you're writing. Another thing, as I was preparing this talk, I saw this tweet come past, uh, and I think actually I put this in the unit test section, but I think it applies for everything, for all your tests, is when you're naming your tests, don't call them like test one, test two, test three, because future you will hate past you. When that test fails and you're looking at it and you're trying to remember what on earth it was that you were testing, something like that just isn't going to help. So use whatever naming convention you like here, but just use something that says, you know, when X is input, Y should happen. Based, try and describe in the name of the test what it is that the test is, is checking. Um, and you can do this, you know, in a variety of ways. If you're just writing, you know, if you're using JUnit 4, you can just put it in the test method. If you're using JUnit 5, then there's a new uh, display name annotation, which lets you, you know, you can um, stick a more human readable uh, name in an annotation rather than it having to try and reverse engineer it from the method name. Um, and just, I would encourage you to think about your names and maybe adopt a convention across your team so that everybody in the team uses the same style for the test method names, so that if someone else in your team comes to look at a test that you've written or vice versa, that you can just look at the name of the test and you can get a rough idea of what the test is supposed to be checking. So that if the test is broken or you're trying to change some code that the test exercises, uh, and the test starts failing while you're doing that, you can figure out, have I made a mistake or was the test wrong or is the, have the, uh, the criteria changed as a result of the modifications that you've made? So imagine here that we've got a typical appli uh, application or subset of an application and we have a bunch of beans that have relationships between them. So some of these beans have dependencies, some of them don't. I think some of these are better candidates for unit testing than others. So all these here that are highlighted in green, they don't have any dependencies. So for me, these are ones that if you are of a mind to unit test, they are great candidates to write unit tests for. You're not gonna have to mock anything, you're not gonna have to scaffold anything. You can just exercise the logic and make sure that with particular inputs, you get the right output. If you look at these components, these have dependencies. So if you want to test these, um, you're probably going to have to mock something. If you want them to be true unit tests, you're gonna have to mock something out. So if you're a Java developer, um, you're probably using Makito. Uh, I think that's generally what we recommend for Spring Boot users. It's what Spring Boot Test provides. Um, and people have mixed opinions about mock. How many people here use mocks in their tests? How many of you avoid mocks like the plague? <laughs> oh, one person. So um, again, I don't think there's any right or wrong here. Um, essentially, when you start mocking something, you have an extra implementation of something to, behave, to maintain. So when you've written uh, expectations against your mock and you say, you know, when this particular method is, is called recall, uh, return this value or throw this exception or whatever may happen, um, you need to keep that behavior that you've mocked out in sync with the actual implementation that's going to be uh, subbed in in a more, you know, in a functional test or when the application is actually running in production. So there's an extra kind of uh, onus on you as a developer to keep things up to date. And you could get into a situation, I'm sure you've all seen it, where your expectations you've set up on the mock diverge from how the service actually behaves. So your unit tests all pass, and then maybe you run a functional test and everything breaks, or then maybe something pops out into production and everything breaks because your mock and your actual service um, got out of sync. So you need to be careful, and generally speaking, assuming you make no, no mistakes when you write the test, the behavior you set up on the mocks are really just a point in time statement saying the thing I'm tested behaved like this at the time that I wrote the test. You then need to remember to keep reviewing that and if someone else changes the behavior of the thing that you've mocked out, you also need to try and remember to review the expectations you've set up and any mocks to make sure that they're kept in sync. 
Another component that we have here, uh, so is here's something that's talking to a server. So imagine that this is something that's talking using REST template, would be a typical example in a Spring app, um, or web client, for example. And these can kind of these can be interesting components to test. You often don't have any choice but to mock something out. You might be in a situation where the live service that this actually calls in a production environment just isn't available to you uh, in your test environment. Or maybe you can kind of get a, um, a staged version of the service that you could call. But you often don't have any choice um, about calling the, uh, the actual real world system. Uh, for example, we've got something um, a little app that we use to in the spring team to keep track of our release calendar and it goes off and looks at github milestones and collects all the information about all the release dates for all of the projects so that thing's talking to github github has rate limits so when we're running the tests we either have to be very careful not to uh, exceed github's rate limits without authenticating or we can have some credentials that we use, which then raises the rate limits. But then we have to worry about in our test suite, we've got to provide those credentials somehow. And then you get into, well, then my test suite doesn't want to have those secrets checked into, open, uh, into you know, it's an open source project. We don't want to have those checked into Git. We then, and it all just gets more and more complicated. So what you can do instead is you can um, use something to mock out the service that you're calling. And how many of you here have heard of mock rest service server? Not many. So this is a hidden gem of the spring test module. And what it does is it lets you basically set something up and you can say, when I receive a request with this particular HTTP verb and maybe these request parameters or whatever, this is the response that I want you to return. So you can set up expectations at the HTTP level um, about how you want this thing to behave, and then you can bind REST template to it. So rather than you doing something like, so REST template, as you may know, implements the REST operations interface. So you could take an approach where you mock out the REST operations interface, and then you set up a bunch of expectations using Marquito to say, when there's a get for entity call with this URI and you know, these, this request entity, this is the response entity that you should return. But that misses out quite a lot of the, uh, the things that your service is actually going to do at runtime. If you're mocking out the REST operations interface, you could make a mistake um, in the URI that you pass in. You could make a mistake in how you're substituting path variables into the URI. Um, your HTTP message conversion might not be quite right. If you use something like mock REST service server, you can take your REST template bind it to the mock REST service server, and then interact at the HTTP level. So you get some, almost for free, you get testing that the REST template calls that you are making are actually mapping to uh, the URI that your service operates at. So if you're, um, like when we were dealing with GitHub, we could basically take the GitHub API documentation and the expected uh, format of um, request and response payloads, and map that onto mock REST service server, and then it gives us a higher degree of confidence that our REST template um, is making the right calls to the, uh, to the actual HTTP backend. If you're not using uh, REST template and you're using web client instead, um, the story isn't quite the same. There is not yet support for using web client with mock REST service server. There is an open issue in the Spring Framework issue tracker to add that support. Um, and I think it's in the 5.x backlog, so we might see it in a future uh, 5.x release of Spring Framework. But in the meantime, you can do something very similar um, with OKHTTP's OK mock web server. So as you may know, OKHTTP OK is another um, HTTP client uh, on the JVM. But it has a mock web server that it provides um, that isn't coupled to OKHTTP. OK and the Spring Framework team, I believe I'm right in saying, use this for testing web client themselves. So they have web client tests, and they set up the mock web server. And in much the way I, as I described for mock REST service server, um, you can set up the expectations on the mock web server. So you can say, you know, when you get a GET request to this URI, return this response. 
when you receive a post request with this payload, then return this response. And you have control over the response body and the status code and all sorts of things. So it, it allows you to do testing of your HTTP clients at the HTTP level, which is really what you care about, that they're making the right HTTP requests and handling the HTTP responses properly without having to worry about the kind of the nitty gritty, exactly, you know, the Java calls that you're making that result in those HTTP requests being made. Um, another piece uh, to look at is imagine that you have something that's doing some data access. And there can be times here where you don't, you're not in a position to call the actual real live database. You probably don't want to be. Um, so say, for example, um, you have some Spring Data repositories. So they're kind of an interesting case because in some cases, very simple CRUD cases, you don't really write very much code. You just have a, an interface uh, that you have written that extends um, JPA repository or CRUD repository or what have you in Spring Data. And then Spring Data actually looks at your interface and the methods, uh, the names of the methods, and generates the appropriate queries that should then be run against what data, ever data backend you're using. For standard CRUD stuff, um, you may just be able to get away with mocking out that repository interface. You know, there's a, maybe there's a find all method that doesn't take any arguments and just returns a list of person. Um, that's probably fine. You could mock that out with Makito um, and drop that in there, and there's very little risk that you know your find all method is going to be uh, there's going to be a mistake in it. If there is. Um, it's going to be in Spring Data because you haven't written anything for the find all. That's a standard method on the CRUD repository interface. If you get into um, the business of writing more complex methods, so uh, for those that you don't know, Spring Data lets you write queries either in the method names or you can also provide additional metadata that let you create queries. Um, so you could write a method name that's like uh, find all where age is greater than 10. Um, and it will turn that into the appropriate query to make in the, the data store, whichever one you're using, uh, be it a, um, an SQL-based data store or a, a, a NoSQL-based data, uh, data store. Th there's support for both, and from the interface and kind of the query levels there, uh, for the purposes here, they are, they are the same. Um, if you're doing that and you've started to write your own queries, either by providing additional methods uh, or by providing metadata um, with via annotations, then you're into the realms of being able to make mistakes and there's more risk. And at that point, I don't think you want to be mocking out the interface. Um, you, need to do, you need to do something else, which we'll talk about in a moment. And I think JDBC template is in a similar boat. How many of you use JDBC template? Still a reasonable number. Yeah, it's perfectly good. If you're writing, you know, if you don't want to use an ORM uh, and you have some SQL queries to make, JDBC template is still a really, really good option. How many of you have tested your database code by mocking out JDBC operations? One person. Two people. Oh, three. Um, the problem, I think, with doing that is that the chance that you make a mistake in your query is too high. So if you mock out JDBC operations and then you just set up expectations, you might have made a typo in your query. You might have got a column name wrong. You might have put a bracket in the wrong place. You might have forgotten to quote something. And if you just mock out JDBC operations rather than actually sending that text as a query to the database, you're not going to find out until something does actually exercise that query against the real database, be that in a a test later on, or be it once it's popped out of your deployment pipeline and is, and is running in production. So a common solution to this problem is to use an in-memory database in your tests. So you could use H2, you could use HSQLDB. Um, as a replacement, typically, uh, some applications you might use an in-memory database. That might be sufficient, depending on the application's persistence needs. But I think that's very much the exception rather than the rule. So you could drop in H2, you could drop in HSQLDB as a replacement, but then you get into, then there's some risk where is H2 or is HSQLDB going to behave in exactly the same way as my backend? 
And H2 has some compatibility modes. So for example, you can run it in Postgres compatibility mode, where it pretends to behave like a Postgres database. So there are things, behavior that is specific to Postgres, and H2 kind of tries to emulate that and behave in the same way. And that's good up to a point where if that compatibility isn't in sync with the version of Postgres that you're using, then you can almost get lulled into a false sense of, of security thinking, I've tested this using H2 in Postgres compatibility mode, all my SQL is absolutely fine. And then you actually find out when you point it at a real Postgres instance that it's not fine and your queries start to break. So I think when that happens, you need an alternative option. Um, and one that I think is really, really good is a project called Test Containers. How many of you have heard of Test Containers? Okay, about half. So for those of you that haven't, um, Test Containers is an open source project that uses Docker uh, and Docker containers to stand up. Um, so it, in this case, you can basically, you can run, it can stand up anything that's in a Docker container. Anything that you can package up in a Docker container, Test Containers um, will help you use in your tests. But a typical usage, and the one I want to talk about here, is for it to stand up an actual genuine instance of Redis, or a genuine instance of Mongo, or uh, MySQL, or whatever data store you are using. Test containers can help you. And it provides integration with JUnit 4 via a rule, and JUnit 5 via an extension, to uh, basically allow you to say in your test, I want uh, Redis, please. And it will go off, and as long as you have uh, Docker running on your machine, it will go off, and you can point it to a particular uh, Docker image for Redis. So that could be one just from Docker Hub, just the standard uh, Redis images on Docker Hub, or it could be any Docker image. It could be one of your own creation, whatever you need. And it will then, when your test runs, it will start up that container for you and then provide you with very easy access to the host name and port that you need to use to communicate with Redis running in that container. And then you can run, or you know, it doesn't have to be Redis, whatever data store, then you can run your tests against that data store, uh, sure that it is in a known good state because it's a fresh Docker container every time. So you don't have to worry about other tests having polluted the database or left things in a broken state things will be exactly as they were left when the Docker image was created, either by a third party that's on a public Docker hub or that you've created. Um, the downside is that the Docker story on Windows doesn't work quite so well, but if you're on Mac or Linux, I would thoroughly recommend checking out something like test containers. And I personally, so in Spring Boot's code base, um, in fact, we have auto configuration for, there's a, um, an embedded Mongo project which kind of tries to do a similar thing. Um, and if you're using Spring Boot's testing support and you have uh, the embedded Mongo dependency on the class path, then Spring Boot's testing support will auto-configure embedded Mongo. But the name embedded Mongo, it's kind of a, it's a bit of a misnomer. It's not really embedded. Uh, it's not embedded um, in the JVM in which your tests are running. What it really means is it's gonna grab hold of a Mongo binary um, start it up on your machine, and then you can, in a similar way, uh, you can get a port to access that Mongo instance, uh, and then you can run your tests against this genuine real-world Mongo instance. And that's great, um, because you're actually testing against Mongo rather than some mocked variant of Mongo. And I think there are projects uh, for some of these data stores that Drew try to mock them and pretend to be the actual real thing but that has some of the same problems of using H2 or HSQLDB in kind of incompatibility mode, where you might get slightly different behavior. For things like embedded Mongo, because it doesn't run in a Docker container, it's running, so if you're um, a Windows developer, you will be running Mongo on Windows, whereas in production, you might be running on Linux. So you've got operating system differences, whereas if you're running your tests in a Docker container, you can get or running the server, uh, the backend service that you're talking to, the data store or whatever it may be, if you're running that in a Docker container, the chances are that you can get closer to your production environment. So you could perhaps use the exact same Linux distribution on the same version of the Linux kernel in the Docker container that your production environment is running on. So it just helps to reduce the risk a little bit by aligning what you're testing against more closely um, with what is running in your production environment.
All right, so that's kind of unit testing and kind of the gray area between a pure unit test and something where you start mocking things out and you start worrying about, um, about databases. But all of those that you can do, um, all those sorts of tests you can do without starting an application context. So you can test JDBC template or a component's use of JDBC template. As long as you're injecting that template uh, into the component, you can, uh, you can test it quite easily. You can mock it out if you want to. Um, you can configure it to talk to test containers by giving it um, a data source with a particular URL. Um, if you're testing REST template, you don't need an application context. You can just bind it um, to the mock REST service server and inject that into your component. But I now want to move on and talk about integration tests. So this is where you're actually starting up an application context. So this is where your application as a whole or part of your application is all being tested and Spring gets involved, the dependencies are being injected, etc. So as I suspect almost all of you know, the main entry point into um, Spring Boot's testing is the Spring Boot test annotation. Um, we also have annotations for slice tests, but if you're doing a full-blown integration test in the Spring Boot world, you will be using Spring Boot Test. And Spring Boot Test hooks into uh, and builds on top of the testing framework in Spring Framework to provide you with kind of a Spring Boot-specific testing experience. So it's the use of Spring Boot Test that means that you get kind of all of the standard Spring application behavior that mimics what you get in your main method when you run your application. So you get, you know, the configuration property binding from Spring Boot. You get the application property support. Um, all those sorts of things are what come by using Spring Boot test um, to, to kind of customize the behavior of um, Spring's test framework. Now, I'm going to get kind of quite down into the details of exactly how the test framework works um, because some Spring Boot test specific features build quite heavily um, upon some kind of lower level parts of Spring's test framework. And one of those is context caching. So what I want to hopefully do here is to give you all an understanding of how Spring's test framework caches context and when you will see a context being reused and when you will see a particular uh, test class creating a new application context. So here we have a typical um, integration test that you might, you know, you've probably all seen something very similar to this. So this is uh, a JUnit4 example. Uh, so the first annotation we come to is run with Spring Runner. And so this is telling JUnit to um, pass over control to Spring Framework's test framework to run the tests. We've then got the Spring Boot test annotation. So this is Spring Boot saying to uh, the test framework, Spring Framework's test framework, that this needs to be a Spring Boot style test. Um, we've then got an active profiles annotation, which is part of Spring Test Framework. So this is tuning the profiles that are active uh, for when you are running a particular test. So this is building on um, the profile-specific bean support or kind of configuring profile-specific bean support. And then we've got test property source, which is another annotation from uh, Spring Framework's test framework that lets you um, provide a property source. So I'm pointing here to a properties file. And then those properties are going to be contributed to the environment. And then Spring Boot's configuration property binding will be able to use those properties as a source. So you can use it to tune things, customize configuration specifically for your tests. Speaking about the environment and customizing it, you can see here I'm using the properties attribute on Spring Boot test. So this is another way of configuring properties. And if you've only got one or two and you don't want to separate them out into a separate file, you can use the properties attribute on Spring Boot test. And it does exactly the same thing. It adds a property source to, um, to the environment. So here, we're enabling JMX for this partic particular test. The key thing with all of, uh, well, almost all of these annotations is um, that they have an effect on the beans that will be present in the application context. So 
Spring Boot Test, uh, Active Profiles, and Test Property Source can all affect beans that appear in the environment. So Spring Boot Test is the thing that turns it into a, um, a test of a Spring Boot application. So it gives you configuration property binding, um, but it also, the crucial thing that it does is it controls the configuration class that's used as like the source for all of your application's configuration. So when you have Spring Boot Test on a test class, we go off looking for a class annotated with Spring Boot application. So you normally have your Spring Boot application on your main class. More accurately, we're actually looking for a class annotated with Spring Boot configuration, but that's a meta annotation on Spring Boot application. So typically in your app, what we're doing here is going off looking for Spring Boot application on a class, and we look up the package hierarchy. So if um, your tests are in com example foo bar, we'll look in that package and then we'll go up to com example foo and then up to com example until we find uh, a class in your main code that is annotated with Spring Boot application. And that is the class that we'll use as kind of the source for how your application is going to be configured. So if it's annotated with Spring Boot application, that means um, Spring Boot's auto configuration will be switched on because that's another meta annotation on Spring Boot application. So that obviously, that can have a huge effect on the beans in your application context because you've switched on auto configuration, so Spring Boot's auto configuration is going to contribute uh, the beans to your context. There's also active profiles. If you enable some profiles, if you activate some profiles in your test and you have profile specific beans, those beans, depending on whether they're, you know, the profile that they belong to is active, will or will not be part of the context. There's also test property source. It can change the properties that are in the environment. And if your code or some auto configuration that you are using has used conditional on property to control the presence or absence of certain beans, then the test property source and the properties that it provides can also affect the beans that are in the application context. Similarly with the properties attribute on Spring Boot test. Anything that manipulates the environment can have an effect on beans that appear in the context. There are a couple of more a couple more annotations that you can use as well that can affect the context. So you can use import to import other configuration classes. You can also use context configuration, which is another way of providing the configuration class that's going to configure the context for your tests. Um, so when you're writing your test, you need to think about all of these different things that are controlling um, and affecting the beans that appear in the, in the context. When the test framework is running a test and it encounters a new, uh, a new test class, when JUnit encounters a new test class, it talks to Spring Boot, uh, it talks to the test framework, tells it to run the test, and the test framework goes off and looks at all of these sources for bean configuration and figures out which beans are going to be in the context. And it creates a cache key based on all of that configuration. And only when the cache key matches a previous test will the context be reused. So if you subtly change the configuration such that you've got one more bean or one fewer beans, then you'll find that the test framework will start a new context for you rather than reusing an old one. So if you're running your Spring Boot test suite and you find um, you know, you've got lots and lots of integration tests and you find that things are slower than you would like, one thing to look at is how many application contexts are being created. And there's uh, logging support that you can turn on in the test framework. If you set all Spring Framework tests to debug logging, it will output information for you about cache hits and misses and things. And it can help you to identify problems or little optimizations you could make to perhaps share configuration across tests so that the application context can be reused. Whether or not that's a problem really depends on how big your application is and how long it takes the context to be re refreshed. So it will vary depending on the size of the application that you're working on. There will also be cases where the context cache, you actually deliberately don't want the context to be cached. You may have a test that has a side effect that leaves the context or something in the context dirty so that it's not in a clean state. And we want our tests to be able to run without having side effects on other tests. We don't want to write tests that need to be run in a particular order because it can lead to strange problems where you run a one bit of the test suite and everything passes and then you run the whole thing and something fails. 
um, all the ordering changes because in theory um, you know the ordering isn't guaranteed to always be exactly the same so you might have something that for example changes the in-memory state of one of your beans um, Dirty's context can help you with that because you're basically saying to the test framework don't cache the context for me. I know that this is going to leave the context in a bad state, and any other subsequent test, even if it uses the same configuration, it needs um, a new context. So now that you've hopefully got an understanding of how the context caching works, I wanted to talk to you a bit about slice test support in Spring Boot. How many of you are familiar with test slices in Spring Boot? OK, cool. So. We have a bunch of annotations um, in Spring Boot, in the Spring Boot test auto configure module that gives you support for testing a particular slice of your application. So you can see here we've got uh, ones for various data backends, so Spring Data LDAP, Spring Data JPA, uh, Spring Data Redis, etc. We've also got a slice for web-related tests, whether you're using Spring MVC, there's Web MVC test, whether you're using WebFlux, um, there's WebFlux test, REST client test, Jute test, various things that you might want to test. And what this lets you do is home in on a particular aspect, a particular slice of your application, rather than testing the whole thing. And it does that via component scan filtering. So when your application starts up and you're using component scanning and we go off looking at the class path to find all of your components, the slice test add a filter to that component scanning process so we remove beans that aren't relevant to the particular slice that you're testing. So for example, if you're testing um, some data JPA stuff, then you don't really care about your web controllers. So we can exclude all of those from the test and just focus on the data JPA part. So to give you a concrete example of this, um, here we have um, a kind of an example application. So we have Spring Boot application on our main application class sitting in one package. And then we have two packages, one for customers and one for orders. And in each, we've got some web stuff, and in this case, some JPA stuff. So we've got interfaces that extend JPA repository. If we use data JPA test, what happens via uh, the component scan filtering is that we get rid of the controllers. So now, when you're setting up your environment, you're not paying the cost of those controllers being created um, during application context refresh, or indeed any of their dependencies. All that will be in the context are the JPA repositories and then the JPA infrastructure upon which they depend. So we'll bootstrap the data source and hibernate and your JPA repositories, and that's about it. Everything else will have been filtered out. Similarly, if you write a web MVC test, we'll kind of we'll do the other side of it. We'll get rid of all of your JPA stuff. So you will no longer pay the cost of bootstrapping Hibernate when you just want to test your web layer. All you'll get are your controllers and all of the JPA stuff, data source, Hibernate, etc., will all um, be filtered out. Now a problem that this creates is or something that you need to do when this happens. For data JPA, it's probably fine because it sits kind of at the bottom of your dependency graph. Um, your data JPA repositories are kind of leaf nodes in the graph in terms of your code. You're not going to be injecting any dependencies into them. But for your controllers, they probably call another service or they might be calling a Spring Data repository or something. So you need to provide something to them for them to interact with. You know, they're going to have some dependencies that need to be injected. And that is where Mockbean and Spybean come in. So you can see here, imagine that we have customer controller integration tests with Web MVC test on it. So I'm saying I just want to test my web layer. I'm injecting my customer repository into the test because I want to set up some behavior on it before I exercise my controller. And I've also had to provide a separate configuration class to provide mocks of the customer repository and the order repository. And there's a lot of ceremony here. It gets a bit clunky. Um, you have to set up all these mocks. So you can replace this uh, with the use of mock bean instead. So this configuration here is 
essentially equivalent to the previous. There's no longer any need for that static inner class that's mocking the customer repository and order repository. Instead, these fields uh, annotated with mock bean are found by Spring Boot's testing support, and we will either replace a customer repository bean in the context of there is one already, or we'll add one to it. Um, so you now have a customer repository or order repository that you can then set the uh, expectations up on in your test. And then you can exercise your controller using mock MVC or whatever you like and check that given certain responses from the repository, it does the, uh, the expected things. There's still something though that's not quite right with this that I don't really like. Um, we've got customer repository, we have customer controller test, customer repository, but we've also got order repository. And that's wrong, I don't like that. Imagine that your customer domain shouldn't know anything about the order domain or, or vice versa. But because these, this code is in separate packages and because we need all of our controllers are going to exist in the context because we've, we've sliced out everything other than controllers and web related stuff, you still need to provide a mocked order repository. And that means you can't make your order repository interface package private. So you've now, just for testing purposes, you've had to increase the visibility of some of your API, which introduces the risk of package tangles or people calling things across parts of your domain when they shouldn't do. So what we'd really like to get to is where we only need to mock out the customer repository to test our customer controller. And what we can do to help with that is that we can say to WebMVC test, I want you to focus just on a specific controller. So I don't want you to focus on all of the controllers, just focus on this one controller. Now you should think about this, but also have in your back of uh, your mind um, the things that I mentioned about context caching. If you are focusing on a specific controller and just WebMVC, that's really narrowed down the beans that are in the context. You're going to get kind of the basic web infrastructure um, that's needed by mock MVC. So you'll get like the mock dispatcher servlet, but you'll just get that one controller. So if you write another test for your order controller and you focus right in on the order controller, you're going to get another context. There's not going to be an opportunity for the, the context cache to reuse that context. So there's a trade-off to be made here. It should be the case and in our experience, it generally is the case that because you're focused in on one specific controller, the time to refresh that application context is minimal because it's got so little in it. So the benefits that you get in terms of uh, code visibility um, and the ability just to focus specifically on what you want to test, in our experience, outweigh the costs of creating the extra context because they are so quick to be recreated. Uh, to be created, sorry. But it is something to bear in mind as you embrace the slice testing support to think about the effect that it can have on context caching because it does affect the beans that are in the context. Just got a couple of minutes left now. Um, so the last thing that I want to mention was JUnit 5. Unfortunately, this talk was yesterday, so I can't ask you all to go to Sam's talk later today, but what I can say is I would thoroughly recommend checking out the recording on YouTube after the, um, after the conference. JUnit 5 is particularly relevant now for Spring Boot users that finally, at long last, we've wanted to do this um, for at least one minor release, if not two. In Spring Boot 2.2, Spring Boot test will give you JUnit 5 by default rather than JUnit 4. So there's loads of goodies in JUnit 5. Uh, the display name stuff that I talked about, nested test classes. Um, there's all sorts of stuff in there. The new extension model. There's loads and loads of good stuff. Uh, check out Sam's talk uh, to learn more about it in a recording. Um, and when you upgrade to Spring Boot 2.2, you will be using JUnit 5 by default, but and the thing that's delayed us uh, in doing this uh, while we've been waiting for the Maven support to be ready is that the way we've configured JUnit 5 in Spring Boot test means that your JUnit 4 tests will continue to run on top of JUnit 5 without you having to change any code. So you can migrate to JUnit 5 whenever you're ready, or you can stick with the JUnit 4 API running on top of the JUnit 5 test execution engine. 
Um, and that's done via um, the vintage engine that is part of JUnit 5 that, as far as your code is concerned, lets it pretend to be JUnit 4. So you can continue to use JUnit 5 and migrate, uh, it's continue to use JUnit 4 and migrate to JUnit 5 as it makes sense um, to do so. There's, it's not going to be a big bang switch when you upgrade to Spring Boot 2.2. And that's all I had. Uh, thank you very much for your time, everybody. I hope you found that useful. Um, I think we're out of time, but um, I'll be out in the hall. So if you have any questions and you want to come up and ask me or you see me around the rest of the day in the conference, please come up and ask me any questions that you've got. Thank you very much, everybody.